spent a good part of the weekend, Jim, tracing that story. I wanted to find out who released the story first. And actually what I found was that Hamas released the story to Al Jazeera. And everybody else in the world, in the media, picked up the Al Jazeera story almost verbatim. And so what I was trying to do is to try and figure out what was going on. And what, what I concluded was that um, the, the terrorists were using the media to spread the untruth about what the attack was. And finally, I think on last Wednesday or Thursday, the federal government announced that their study and the satellite imaging that they had showed that the bomb actually came from within uh, Gaza and was another terrorist group, Palestinian terrorist group that launched it and that it actually fell in the parking lot, did not fall on the hospital. And there weren't 500 plus people killed. There were some more between 100 and 300. And they were not mostly patients. They were people who were in their cars in the parking lot. But I found that. I can't find it anywhere else because nobody else in the news media picked it up. And, it's, and I said in the commentary, it is the same kind of situation that Donald Trump faced when the Democrats decided to, to spread the story about Russian collusion. They told the story, they lied more, they continued, and they stepped on people's toes from them to begin to investigate what happened. And when, when it was finally proven that it, it wasn't true, it was fake news, nobody lost their job. In fact, people who won Pulitzer Prizes weren't asked to return them for reporting false information. <laughs> they still got them. And so in, in this case, we have, we have uh, it, it's kind of ironic that I'm using this example, but Goebbels under the, under the Hitler regime said, if you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, people will believe it to be true. And that's what happened here on this bombing. Nobody, nobody's talking about it. People are talking about it and they're saying, you know, we, we gotta, we got to stop this. We need a ceasefire, all this stuff. And very few news agencies reported that on the first day of the war, Hamas launched 6,000 missiles towards uh, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and other cities in, 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 in Israel. Nobody talked about that. Nobody talked about that. You know, there's a, another sidebar story out there, Jim. There seems to be a shortage of drinking water in Gaza. Okay? Yeah. You know why? You know why? Because the terrorists dug up the water pipes to use them as the casings for their rockets and their missiles. Really? James, yes. I take it to you on my article, damn it. I know. I just I'm I'm just amazed that all this goes on and that we've we've we we've, we've got you know money for war we've got money for this we've got money for that but when it comes to providing people drinking water it just it's insane yeah and they're using the pipes in the ground to make because they are not the Hamas people. Very important. The Hamas people are not rocket scientists. So they don't know how to really build an effective rocket or missile. And that's why so many of them fall and explode in, in Gaza and never make it to Israel. Because they're not rocket scientists. And they're making them in their garages and their basements. They're not, their, they're not rocket scientists. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and so so we 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 have this situation, you know, and and I, um, but here's again, 
Uh, I did an interview with uh, the, the president. You like that, huh? You're still uh, laughing. That, that. That, that is amazing. Uh, well, we've got to do this. We've got to take a okay. quick little time out. I've got to switch Skype calls because our guest is in another Skype call. So I've got to switch. Okay. I've got to switch calls. We're going to take a quick little time out. When we come back, we'll have Dan and IQ and our next guest on the other side. It is, of course, the big broadcast. Attention, people with Medicare and anyone turning sixty-five. Are you enrolled in the best medical? Um, just a incredibly terrible, difficult, frustrating, angry golf course, but ma- amazing. Um, and uh, I was th- I was there in one of your drought seasons, which can be devastating, especially with fires. But what I wanted to ask you is, I wanted to get a perspective um, about what's going on in your country. Do you have a illegal immigration problem in your country? Well, not really, because we're a long way from everything else. So <laughs> to actually to, to actually get into Australia illegally, you, you are seriously taking your life into your hands, getting in some boat and going over oceans to get to our country. So we are so isolated. About maybe five, probably ten years ago, we had quite a few boats arriving from the north, but that got, that got shut down. Wow. Well, we have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. He joins us, uh, I guess, since he said it, he's joining us from the future. Uh, he is he is absolutely amazing and uh he's the 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 topic today is a customer experience in crisis customer commerce revolutionizes retail and uh one of the things that um you know I, I, I talk about it every once in a while. I know that Dan has talked about it every once in a while, and that is poor customer service. And poor customer mm-hmm. service experience leads to yearly losses of $3.1 trillion globally for online retailers and e-commerce merchants. And e-commerce brands grapple with providing a seamless experience for online shoppers. Slow websites, 79% of customers do not return to an online store after experiencing a slow-loading website. Negative customer and service experience, which is 35% of shoppers reduce spending with a brand after a bad experience. Or if you're in Hutchinson, Kansas, you just go back there because you only have that only option. Um, However, however, in the U.S. alone, $840 billion worth of sales revenue is lost annually due to inferior customer experience. 73% of consumers abandon a brand after three or fewer inferior customer service experiences, and 80% of consumers prioritize speed, convenience, expertise, and friendly service for a positive customer experience, and 86% of buyers pay more for a great customer experience, which I will have to say that I have done that locally, Michael. If yeah, if they are a good customer, you know, experience location, whether it's a restaurant, a retail place, whatever, if they're expensive, I don't care because I got good customer service there. <laughs> so, with all this in mind, uh, Michael, you have an incredible background, and. Talk to us a little bit about all these numbers and all these things that I threw out there. Because I know Dan and IQ are going to have some questions for you, especially due to the fact that IQ is joining us from the United Kingdom. So he can fill us in on what the hell's going on over there. And uh, Dan, of course, is in uh, Florida, of all places. So, Michael, go go ahead. Fill us in here on this, baby. Yeah, look, I think that... The number one thing that's come out of all this is over the last five or six years, with everything that happened globally, people are moving online. You know, they're having to rely on this faceless person on the other end of a telephone or the other end of an email chat or a chatbot or whatever to look after them. And there's there was sort of a shift over the past decade or two to try and take out all of the time-wasting parts of a commerce sales. So if you think of what commerce is, commerce is the process 
to me going, hey, I need something, you have something, I'll use something to get the thing I want, right? That's yeah. It's been around since the dawn of time for humanity. And up until the mid, late, late 19, uh, early 2000s, really, that transaction always happened with a person and another person face to face. And what some large corporates started realizing and, and a lot of entrepreneurial businesses started realizing is, hey, we don't actually have to talk face to face. You could just sort of transact with this machine and get what you want and make it a faster transaction, right? So the goal was to speed up commerce. The problem is that over the decades since then, we've now gotten into a situation where the wrong things are getting optimized, right? So the the speed of the transaction is still trying to be increased. We're still trying to do more commerce online and we're trying to make it simpler for the shopper or the customer and we're trying to make it simpler for the business owner and the vendor. But we've gone too far. And what's happened now is that in a lot of small business engagements, you don't feel like a customer. You feel like a money giver or something, right? <laughs> like there's, it's a soulless transaction where you may or may not get the thing you want um, within a time frame you experience. And we've just lost this, you know, connectedness between the online retailer and the customer. Now, for really big businesses, Amazon, whatever, doesn't matter. You know, you're going into that transaction expecting a soulless experience, right? You Really, when you're, when you're working with someone like Amazon or large organizations like Macy's or whatever, you, you know they're too big to care about your $3.50. Like, that, you're going into that eyes wide open. For a small business, though, that connection is their superpower. So they've basically followed the leader of these massive global giants and lost their differentiator, which is their superpower of connection. And you can see that now where a majority of customers will actually prefer to buy on Amazon than to buy from the small business owner because they trust Amazon more because they're a bigger company. But the small business owner, if they can have that relationship, will win the business every time. So that's what this whole customer commerce revolution that I'm trying to spearhead is all about, that these small business owners, their superpower is their passion, their love, their they want to produce this product or service and they want to improve the community or society somehow because... Let's face it, being a small business owner is not, you know, all roses and, and happy melodies and tracks. You work long hours. You have to be doing it for a passion. So I want to enable that small business owner to regain that superpower of having that connection with the customer and actually start competing with these larger giants no longer on a level playing field, if that makes sense. Okay, Dan, jump in there. I know you've got questions. Yes, sir. I... I uh... <laughs> You know, one of my greatest frustrations in life is to go onto a website and try and find a phone number for the company. Yeah. <laughs> to talk to a human being. And sometimes you get a, you get a chat box, which is a, a, a robot. It's not a real person. You have to ask, can I please speak to a real person? And then they get you over there. Yeah. One of the, th one of the things that... Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, and whether you experience it in Australia or wherever you're doing versus what we have. We have these uh, in mainline stores all over the country, these, these gangs that come in and raid a store and clean it out and nobody does anything. And I'm guessing, you can tell me if I'm wrong, if I was a customer and I was in that store when the people all dressed in black came in with their hammers and everything else and started breaking cases and taking stuff out of the store and put was in a threatening environment, I think there's a better than even chance I'm never going back to that store again. Yeah, totally. Or, or any of their stores. Yep. Because you never know where they're going to be. Yet the store owners don't seem to want to be able to do anything about protecting their customers when people come in to try and rob them and take their merchandise so yeah, do you have I that think, in obviously yeah look i think so but the i think the thing to also look at that is uh it's probably the the job of the state to look after the policing and the and the activities you know uh, telling merchants that they need to 
post armed guards everywhere and, and use force to... Definitely they should look after their customers. But I think you actually hit on a really important point there is that the current systems are designed to reduce the amount of personal interaction, right? There's a, a really great saying. If you're having an argument with someone, the best thing to do is sit down with them and share a meal, right? Because you, that personal connection is what's going to build the long-term relationship. It's going to solve all the problems. It's going to work out that communication that's needed to build that affinity uh, for the other person. And what you hit on right at the start of that that communication was around the um busyness of trying to remove that personal two-way communication by having chatbots and having all these things and different systems and different platforms um, around the place. So that's that's been really challenging. I, I, I've been a, uh, a buyer of Apple products probably for almost as long as they've been in business. I had way back in the beginning one of their Macintosh and even a com uh, computer before that, but but it's again it, this is another place where it's very difficult to find a phone number that you can call somebody that can help you. Yeah, and even and, and so, it, but that's just at Apple. Uh, a lot of these online places where they have products that I want to buy make the experience so frustrating. You just walk away. Yep. And these are not small companies necessarily. These can be large companies. Yeah. And, or even worse, when you get on the phone, the first, the probably the most common phrase you ever hear when you're calling customer support is, please wait while I log into the other system. Or, <laughs> hey, I just bought this widget from you um, and, and I need the spare part for the widget. And they go, oh, what widget did you buy? And you're like, well, it's, it's a red pen. And they go, well, okay, yeah, but what's the model number? You know, I literally just bought it on your website. Oh, I don't have access to that. Sorry, can you read the model number? Well, hang on a minute. Let me get a magnifying glass. Where's the model number? Oh, it's down the back around the corner. You need a light. You know, Why are we putting customers through this, right? So this whole idea of customer <laughs> commerce is get all of that data into one system. So you're not afraid. Like part of the reason that I think small business owners or even fairly large ones won't put phone numbers on the website is it's such a a time sink if you don't have the underlying infrastructure to support that, right? right? If if your support person can answer the phone and say, hi, Daniel, thanks for calling. Uh, how can I help you? And say, look, I just bought this thing on the website. I realized I need a filter for it. Can you tell me what the filter is? Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I can see you bought the model ABC. You need the filter one, two, three. Would you like me to send you a payment link via email right now? Yes, please. That'd be great. Okay, good. That's done. It should be in your inbox now. Just click that. Yep, I can see your payments in here. No problems. We'll have that shipped out in half an hour. Now, if you can have systems which support your support team to be able to do that, then you're not afraid to have a support team because they're not sitting there for hours trying to fight system A versus system B versus system C, trying to extract the data somehow between all these different computers. And it, it's really incredible when you think about it, how much we're paying humans to get computers to talk to computers. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. It's such an expensive waste of money. And that's really what my... I saw this gap seven years ago. I saw this trend. And I went, we need to shift this commerce back to customer commerce, right? What is the customer need? How do we enable that customer commerce to happen fast, repeatably, reliably? You know, remove all these stops and barriers from people paying you money. And I think this whole, you know, support chat, why, why can't I call someone, like... Yeah, you should be able to call someone. So are we, talk, human touch. are we talking about the idea that tens of thousands of businesses were formed on an internet, internet business model and the dominance of those businesses creating what the infrastructure is supposed to look like for a small business, especially on the uh, web because they have no bricks and mortar, uh, has been the driving force behind all this change? Yeah, I, in a big way. I think there's, when you look at any new industry, the first thing that happens is 
lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of solutions are created for little niches of that industry as people are trying to figure out, well, where is the actual product here? What is it we actually need to enable? And you go to a small business right now and you say, hey, you online. They go, yeah, we do e-commerce. And you go, okay. So first off, you you say, I'm sorry, you know, are you okay? Because <laughs> they need to be doing customer commerce. It's like another level. But when you ask them about that, they will have 10 or 20 different software systems hooked together trying to deliver that e-commerce experience. And all of those systems have to try and talk to each other somehow. And quite often they don't or they don't properly. So they have to get people to go and make sure those systems are talking to each other. And this creates a very fractured experience for the customer. And you experience this all the time when you're buying things online. Um, great example, you, you go and buy something on the line, on the line, <laughs> you go buy something online and if you walk into a retail store, odds are 95% plus that they're going to have no idea who you are. They're not going to be able to look up your order, right? They're not going to be able to tell you, well, you bought item A, you need item B. And then you walk out of the store having bought the wrong item from the retail store to call support. And now they won't be able to see, they might be able to see your online order, but you're not going to be able to see the retail order for a day or two until the system synchronizes. So this is what, this is what we're trying to remove. I, or, have, or fix. I have a story for you, Michael. <laughs> Please go ahead. I try uh, last. I don't know. I think it was this last summer. For whatever reason, the Facebook algorithm decided that I needed to purchase a disco ball cowboy hat. It looked like a disco ball, and it was a cowboy hat. And I decided, you know something, I think I might have to purchase that because it's ridiculous. And I tried to find a disco suit, a, a, a suit that looked like a disco ball. And I found one at a place called Spirit Halloween, which are these Halloween stores in the United States. They pop up every... You know, beginning of October, Christmas and yeah. Halloween here. Yeah. yeah, and and they usually pop up in old abandoned malls, and they're all over the game dang place. And apparently, they're owned by Spencer Gifts, which I was not aware of, but apparently they do. And I went to one of these Spirit Halloween things one time, and I found the suit. I found the suit that would match the cowboy hat. And oh my God, but it was the wrong size. <laughs> so I went to the register and I said, hey, you guys have a medium. I take a 2X. However, I will give you money right now if you order it and have it shipped to the store. And they were like, well, we can't do that. We can have it shipped to your house. I'm like, I don't care. I got, you know, the $86 or whatever it is to buy it right now. And they're like, well, we need you to get on the website and order it. And I said, exactly. well, if I get on the website like, and order it, why <laughs> am I here here's in your store? <laughs> exactly. And they're like, get on the website and order it. So I get on the website. I leave the store. I'm mad. I get on the website. The website doesn't know what I'm talking about. They don't have it. So... <laughs> I get a hold of their little chat bot person who forwards me to a live person. And they don't know what I'm talking about. So I go back to the store the next day. I take, for punishment. Uh, <laughs> that was, yes, that was the punishment. I go back to the store. I take a photo of the, uh, of, of the tag front and back, send it to them. And they go, we don't have this. They don't have this. It's in their store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What in the exactly. world did and, I just experience there, Michael? Yeah. What you, tried, <laughs> what you experienced was the wrong optimization, right? So the, the owners were going, well, we're going to put the store online with their own point of sale, and we're going to put the website online with its own thing. But the stocks are going to be different and we're going to have different locations and all this. It's the wrong optimization, right? You put in better part of what? Three, four hours of your time trying to <laughs> yes. pay them? $100, Try, trying right? to save. And see, this was the thing. The exact same item was on Amazon for $109. 
But it was $86 in this spirit Halloween. And I'm like, you know, I'm so tired of funding yeah, Jeff Bezos and his help. yachts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this, is, this, I think, is, is such the point that small to medium business owners really need to understand is that yes. clients want to care about them. They want that personal interaction. They want that ability to know that they're helping someone yes. build their life as yes. opposed to giving another $3.50 to Jeff Bezos. You know, it's like he frankly doesn't need it, you know. No. So how can, how can we get in there and, and help them? And having all of those things in one platform, in one system, that's exactly what we built, you know, Store Connect customer comments for. It's that one system. So you're looking at the same stock level. As long as, you know, they've got the stock levels they didn't put it correctly and someone just didn't walk a suit in off the street and put it on the shelf. But, you know, given that, then that interaction would have happened very differently. You would have gone up to the point of sale counter. This is how it should have happened. Hey, I've got this suit. It's an M. I need an XL. Yeah. Can you order one in for me? Um, yeah, sure. Look, let me have a look. Ah, oh, tell you what, we can order it in. It could be here tomorrow. Or 20 minutes down the road at Blah Blah Mall, they have three of them in stock. Do you want me to put one on hold and you can just go yes. and pick it up? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, good. Give me your 86. Bun, dun, 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 dun. Here's your receipt. You'll get an email to show them at the other end. Have you got the email on your phone? Yep, you do. Great. Off you go. Go get it. Pick it up. Like, that's how that should have happened. I bought and, I, I bought a computer one time that way. Right. <laughs> and they they had it down the road. Yeah. And they That's I went right. and got in this it. world of instant gratification. <laughs> you you can't necessarily compete with Amazon in terms of, you know, one hour delivery because you just don't have the resources. Yeah. But you can compete on this personal <laughs> connection, on this communication. Dan, Michael, I have a, a follow up question if I might yes. um, go, Dan. Uh, there, there, we talked about the startup businesses doing businesses on the web, and that was their primary delivery system. Yeah. We then we had a whole different other group of people who were bricks and mortars who decided that they needed a web presence. Mm -hmm. How did they do? Not great. <laughs> because the, the problem is that the, the bricks and mortar, the software that you need to run a point-of-sale system traditionally has been turned Oops. Oops. So uh -oh. My video just went, but I'm still here. Are you here? Yes. Yeah, we, 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 we still got you, baby. Okay, keep, keep talking, man. We're, we're, so, um, we're, we're still here. The Yeah, the power outage is going longer. My UPS is starting <laughs> oh, to go. No! <laughs> but that's okay. I'm still here. Um, the, the brick and mortar stores, they had this uh, aim, uh, software systems that allowed them to look after their, you know, stock and inventory and point of sale and things like this. What they didn't have was this connection to the website. And then all these small businesses couldn't afford the massive million dollar systems to fully integrate their online and their website operations because that's how much they costed. So what they ended up doing was starting separate software packages to launch their website. And therein lies the problem, right? You go and sign up for a $25 or a $50 or $100 a month you know, Squarespace or Shopify or whatever, you get the site up and running, which is great. But then straight after that, you're now in a situation where you now have two sources of truth, two different bits of information running at the same time. And then you have to keep them in sync somehow. And that's that's where you hit that problem. And then you need a support system. So then you go and buy some online support tool that does, you know, online chat and support tickets and all of that. And that doesn't know about your point of sale system and it doesn't know about your website system and now you have three sources of truth and then you buy a marketing tool to market to all of your companies uh, all of your clients about what products they should buy and it doesn't know about the past purchases so then you get the other fantastic thing that happens all the time where you've just bought an item and they intelligently send you an email saying hey would you like 10 percent off the item you just bought you're like, well, I'd love a 10% refund, but you're not offering that. Why are you giving me a promo code? I just bought the thing. 10% <laughs> refund. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is small businesses are not, they're not stupid, right? They're, they're trying to give what they think the customers want. They want the online access. They want the point of sale. They want the support system. They want marketing. They want discounts. The problem is that they haven't had the tools to be able to do that in one platform before now. And that's the key difference between what 
I'm trying to bring to market in terms of, you know, customer commerce with Store Connect versus what's out there. You know, you really right now you have two options in the market. You can either spend one or two or three million dollars to get a fully integrated system, you know, at, like what Amazon use and et cetera, or you get 15 different platforms and somehow hook them together through blood, sweat and tears. So we're trying to bring to, to market, or we are bringing to market, we've got lots of happy customers, a product that does the million dollar solution for, you know, five, 10 grand. So this is where, or 20 grand, this is where that difference really uh, pops in and, and, you know, what I want to solve. Because as I said before, you know, the small business owners, they want to help their customers. That's that's why they're there. They're not doing it only for the money, I, I guarantee you. My dad said to me one day, Michael, if you run your own business, you have total and complete freedom to choose exactly which 80 hours a week you want to work. And it's true. You know, you, you have to really put in the work. So I guess that's, that's what uh, I'm seeing in the market and... You know, when small business owners realize that it's possible to do it in one platform, they're really happy because they know how much time it's going to save their customers. And really, that was the whole point of going online in the first place. It was trying to save time of the customer, you know, have a 24-7 shop. So how do we get them in? So this saves time of the customer properly. Michael, um, one more question. I'm, we're almost out of time. Um I listened to what you said, and, and I was thinking about uh, what's happened in the United States. It may be different than Australia. <clears throat> we created, because of the pandemic, we created a, an, an environment where people were paid not to work. And so they had two years of doing nothing and being paid well to get to do nothing. But the other spin on that was service industry jobs, entry-level jobs, the price of admission uh, to hire somebody changed dramatically. Uh, we've got entry-level jobs in the States at McDonald's at $15, $16, $18 an hour, um, double what they were three or four years ago. And, and so that the, the, the cost of labor has skyrocketed. And, uh, and, and trying to find enough people to work has become a challenge. So given those kind of situations, uh, aren't corporations forced more and more to have to go into online as opposed to store, regular buck and mortar stores? I mean, a lot of them are closing and trying yeah. to do it all online. Yeah, they are. And I think, like, just to be clear, we have clients worldwide, so we're seeing this across the world, and there were similar situations here. There's a, a labour shortage, you know, in every country that we operate, including Australia, the US, and in, in Europe. That's a, a global phenomenon. The thing is that it is getting more expensive to hire people. It's getting even more expensive to hire good people. So then if that's the case, the software systems we should be putting in place right now are systems that optimize the time of our customer and the time of our staff, not the time of the computer systems, right? I, I said this earlier in the, in the call, but I'll say it again, because when I say this to small business owners, they all look at me and nod. Stop paying people to get computers to talk to computers, right? So... If, you're, if you've got seven different computer systems and the staff are constantly having to move between them to try and service this customer who is getting at every step more and more frustrated, it's going to make that staff member feel bad, like they're going to have a bad work experience because they're not able to do what they're being paid to do, which is to help this customer in a timely manner with the right information to get their situation resolved. If you're putting your staff into a situation where they can't do that, they're going to leave and then you're going to have to find more staff. So conversely, if you can give them the right tools and they can help their customers, you're going to have happy staff, you're going to have happy customers and you'll have more business and you can afford to do all of this. Michael, I have one more question and I think we're almost out of time. You said it's getting more expensive to hire people and even more expensive to hire good people was your word. Yep. 
tell me what you say to a company that's considering hiring you. What is a what is a good what's a good person? What do you what do you say about what's the difference between a person and a good person? A a general person will will rock up to work to get a paycheck, and they're motivated only by money. A good person is obviously they're going to get paid well, but they know that because they'll do a good job, and that they care about what they're doing, and that they're aligned with the purpose of what the company's doing. And they want to be a team player. They know where they are on the on the organisation. They know their responsibilities. They take responsibility for that, and they get productive and get active. And that's really the the difference. You know, we've had we've had customers actually install our software so that they keep their staff because they had so many different systems that the staff were just leaving because they were sick of it. So you know, a good person will want to produce, will want to be active, will want to be proactive, will want to take responsibility for their environment and their customers and their team. And that's really what you're looking for in a small business owner. The rest can be trained. You know, pretty much anything else, you can train someone. You can always train a competent person to do a job. So what you're looking for is someone who cares about producing and wanting to be productive and wanting to create something of value, you know, and that's probably the primary thing to look for. I think that is awesome. So, um, before we let everybody go, I want to start with IQ Alrizoli. IQ, how do we get your books and everything that you're doing, my friend? Yeah, on Amazon, lifting the veil, the true faces of Muhammad and Islam. Very, very, very interesting conversation from Australia. Congratulations. Wish you well. Thank you. So, Dan, uh, bring us up to speed on everything you're doing, my friend. You're muted. You might need to unmute. I'm, I'm back. I'm there back. I'm are. sorry. Okay. I was yeah. trying to... Trying to uh... <laughs> you're a busy man. Oh, I know. You're a very busy uh, man, Dan. <laughs> just, just before we went on the air today, IQ and I decided that... Uh, He's going to be on my show on Friday, so we're going to have a conversation about what's going on in the Middle East. Um, I'm have a, I have a conference call tomorrow with my publisher on my next book, which I'm really, really excited about. Uh, and um, I've got a, 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 a small business opportunity that I'm working on that um, I think is going to be terrific in the United States. And... Uh, uh, we're we're going to take uh, a lethal weapon and take it out of people's hands and put something else in their hands in terms of a weapon that's not lethal but can stop bad guys so you can protect yourself, your family, and your home. And that's it. Just it's 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 coming to life rapidly. It's like uh, uh, Frankenstein. You pull a switch and it's it's coming. Um, website is. Uh, danperkinsmedia.org and uh, of course songs and stories for soldiers and um, danperkins.guru is a personal website and as always Jim thank you for having me on yeah so Michael uh, how do we get in touch with you online and everything that you're doing yeah quite simply you'll go to customercommerce.com it's one word customercommerce.com that will send you to our store connect product and you can contact us there, and uh, we have a phone number on our page, and you can call us, uh, both in the USA and in Australia. And, and somebody will answer. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> That's the right answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, customercommerce.com, and if you are a small to medium business that's looking to get out of what we call plug-in or SaaS purgatory, where you've got all these systems dragging you down, give us a bell, and, and we can hook you up with the right people to show you a way out. That is awesome. Well, Michael, you have been amazing. Dan, as always, uh, Dan Perkins Media is the place to be for Dan. And uh, Michael, thanks for doing this, my friend. And we will talk to everybody very soon. And uh, okay, great. that wraps it up here for this edition of our big broadcast. We are live coast to coast and border to border each and every day over there at JiggyJaguar.com. That is that.